Yes. And, uh, right. Thank you for that warm welcome, Lisa. I'm going to actually, given this audience here, uh, get right into the meat of a number of issues that we'll spend the next half hour or so uh, getting right into. So I'm going to start by telling a story about the origin of the spread of stakeholder capitalism known to you as woke capitalism, the mixture of progressive agendas the, and the advancing of those project, progressive agendas through big business. But I'm gonna ask you to keep one thought in the back of your minds, which we'll come back to at the end, which is the role of states in addressing this problem. And I'm gonna end on an optimistic note, I promise you, that I think that states can actually be the agents of positive change to solve this problem, both by wearing their hat as lawmakers, but also by wearing your hats as market participants. And I'm going to come back to that at the end, but I'll ask you to keep it in mind for the duration of the talk. So the story I'm going to tell you first begins with the 2008 financial crisis. Many of you remember that. I remember it well. It was actually uh, in the fall of 2007 that I got my first job out of college at a hedge fund in New York City right on the eve of the 08 crisis. Very interesting job to get a, very interesting time to get a job in the finance industry. I remember it well. What happened in the wake of the 2008 financial crisis is the public's perception of Wall Street and big business changed dramatically in those two years. And in my opinion, for good reason. <laughs> because bankers made a lot of money when times were good. They got bailed out by the public fisc when times went bad. And so in the aftermath of those bailouts, Occupy Wall Street was on Wall Street's doorstep. What they wanted was change in their expectation from American capitalism. And what the old left wanted to do, agree or not, was to then take money from those wealthy corporate fat cats and to redistribute it to poor people to help poor people. Agree or not, that's what they had to say. That is part of what led to the birth of a new movement in this country, though, because there was a new wing of that left right around that same time that had a slightly different agenda. It was not to address poverty or economic injustice like most of the old left, like the Occupy Wall Street left. But it was to also say that actually the real problem was also racial injustice and misogyny and bigotry and the racially disparate impact of climate change. And that actually presented the opportunity of a generation for Wall Street and big business in this country to be able to say that you know what? <laughs> I don't know if I love the Occupy Wall Street demands, but that new left demand I can actually get on board with. I can applaud diversity and inclusion. I can put some token minorities on my board. I can muse about the racially disparate impact of climate change after flying on a private jet to Davos. This is actually pretty good work <laughs> if you can get it. But it came with a catch. It came with an implicit demand that the new left look the other way when it came to leaving that corporate power structure intact. And I think that was the arranged marriage that defined the trend that we've seen over the course of the next 14 years thereafter, neatly wrapped around with three letter acronyms, SRI from socially responsible investing to ESG, environmental, social and governance factors to CSR, Corporate Social Responsibility, to my favorite one, CCP, <laughs> which you all know well, and I think has been a separate agenda that's actually been advanced, which we'll come back to. But, but this, this trade worked so well for Wall Street and the big banks to defang the Occupy Wall Street movement, to defang the old economic redistributionist left to focus on the new identity politic obsessed left that worked so well. Talk about systemic racism all you want, as long as you don't talk about systemic financial risk. That worked so well that actually Silicon Valley then observed that and got in on the act. Because what Silicon Valley recognized in this country was that prior to 2010, the biggest threat to monopoly power in Silicon Valley, the old version of the breakup big tech, actually came from the left. So what they recognized was that we can enter the same implicit transaction to say that, you know what? 
We will lend our corporate power in service of advancing the ends of that left, but we will not do it for free. We effectively expect that the new left look the other way when it comes to leaving our monopoly power intact. We will take down hate speech and misinformation and content as you wish to define it that others should not see on the internet. Whatever needs to be done by way of content moderation, we will do. But again, we have an implicit quid pro quo in return, and that is the autonomy from the demands of that old left to continue aggregating that level of monopoly power. See, that is the defining trade that I think drove the merger of corporate power and state power over the course of the last decade and a half in this country. And it worked so well, starting on Wall Street, and then it worked so well for Silicon Valley, that that's when the rest of corporate America then decided to get on the train. Coca-Cola issuing new statements about voting laws in Georgia, many of you are familiar with, that make it sound more like a super PAC than a soft drink manufacturer. Teaching its employees how to be less white, all the while saying nothing and avoiding the conversation about their own products impact on the nationwide epidemic of diabetes and obesity, including in the black community that they profess to care so much about. Nike criticizing slavery 250 years ago in the United States to no end, while actually doing nothing to reduce their own reliance on slave labor today to produce $250 sneakers that they sell to those black kids in the inner city who can't afford to buy books for school. This was a game that worked out pretty well for both sides. It was an arranged marriage, okay? I, I use this term intentionally. My parents had an arranged marriage. It actually worked out really well. I'm, I'm, I've grown more partial to the model as in my, in my adult life, if, if you learn, think about it a little bit. But this was not the arranged marriage of love, okay? This was an arranged marriage of convenience. It was an arranged marriage in which each side actually didn't love the other side. They secret, secretly had disdain for the other side but they got into the relationship anyway. It was more like mutual prostitution because each side got something out of the trade. And the net result was the birth of this new woke industrial complex, a new force, a new Leviathan in modern American life that was far more powerful than what Thomas Hobbes envisioned 400 years ago, far more powerful than what our founding fathers envisioned 250 years ago when they put into motion a three-part system of government with checks and balances, not envisioning a fourth branch of government in the private sector itself that would suck the lifeblood out of the constitutional government that we put into motion. And it is a new monster that actually duped both sides into submission. The old left that used to be skeptical about the aggregation and misuse of corporate power was defanged and deflected by the fact that actually they were distracted by the fact that these new guys are going to advance the causes, the progressive causes that we love so much that they forgot about their principled opposition to settling political questions through corporate power. And for the conservative wing's part, conservatives were duped into submission by memorizing and reciting slogans that we all memorized back in the 1980s saying that the free market can do no wrong without recognizing that that free market does not exist today. And that's the story of how both sides actually contributed to the creation of possibly the most powerful force in modern American life, this merger of state power and corporate power. And it got a little bit worse in the last few years because there was another cynical force behind the scene, not just the financial interests of domestic firms here at home, but more importantly, the sovereign interests of another market actor on the other side of the Pacific. That was the Communist Party of China. And what they recognized is that this spread of apologist capitalism, I don't even call it woke capitalism, I want to be very specific, apologist self-critical capitalism here in America presented the opportunity of a generation for advancing Chinese interests. That might sound ridiculous. How could that be? These are two different topics, right? Not quite. What they recognized is this was an opportunity to use multinational corporations that are based here in the United States to undermine the greatest geopolitical asset that America ever had. And I will give you a clue that is not our nuclear arsenal. It is our moral standing on the global stage. 
What they recognized is that if we could get America's own companies to erode, chip away at that asset, our moral standing, then China actually creates a false moral equivalence between the US and China. I'll explain to you how it works. Actually, it becomes very simple if you just listen to Xi Jinping, by the way. The first thing he says, every time he's pressed about the Uyghur human rights crisis in the Xinjiang province, where there are over one million Uyghurs enslaved in concentration camps, subject to forced sterilization, communist indoctrination, and worse, the first thing that he says is that Black Lives Matter shows that the United States is no better. Exactly, according to his translator, at least, that's what he says. His top diplomat, though, this is not an accident. This is a planned vision. It, if, actually, if you look at the internal documents in inside the Chinese Communist Party, this is consistent with their strategy. Their top diplomat came to the Alaska summit last year, spoke to Tony Blinken, who was so surprised he couldn't even blink an eye. Okay? First thing he told him for 15 minutes is that China wants to see the U.S. do better on human rights and that China wants to see the U.S. stop slaughtering, that is his word, slaughtering black Americans. That this would be laughable if it weren't for the fact that our own corporations lend implicit moral credibility to those claims by relentlessly criticizing social injustice here at home and taking steps even in our sphere of government to advance that self-critical vision in America without saying a peep about the actual human rights atrocities abroad. Microaggression obsession here at, at home, willful blindness to the actual macroaggressions abroad. I don't even need to go through the list of examples here. You all are familiar with, I'll just give you one to make, to make this really real. Take Disney, right? You know what Disney did this year? The national campaign they've pledged to for transgender education and gender identity amongst first, second, and first, second graders and kindergartners. I frequently said the bill shouldn't have been called don't say gay, it should have been called by the media wait till eight, as in you know, wait till you're eight years old. We need to get better at rhyming our laws. That might be one of the lessons that we, that we learn as state legislators. But, but put that to one side. That's the campaign that Disney goes on. A Couple years ago, they did the same thing in the state of Georgia, by the way. They said they couldn't film in the state of Georgia if Georgia passed the equivalent of a heartbeat bill, an anti-abortion statute. That's what Disney does here at home. Last year, they go to literally ground zero of that Uyghur human rights crisis to Xinjiang in China and film Mulan without saying a peep until the very end of the movie, you can still see it in the credits today, they muster up the courage to say we thank the local authorities for allowing us the privilege of filming here. The very authorities who are responsible for the largest scale subjugation of human beings as slaves on the planet. That's Disney. Nike, Airbnb, BlackRock, you name it, the NBA, this is the trend. And you ask yourself why it is these companies behave this way. It's actually pretty simple. It comes down to money. At the end of the day, China builds a great Chinese wall that prevents American market actors from entering the Chinese market if they criticize the CCP. But they quietly roll out the red carpet if you are also criticizing the United States. And that's the game they have played, recognizing that China was never going to defeat the US militarily, just as Greece was never going to defeat Troy militarily. What Greece recognized is that he couldn't beat Troy from the outside. You use the Trojan horse to undermine it, to burn Troy from within. And that's really the playbook from which China has taken its page, recognizing that they could use global capitalism itself as the Trojan horse to weaken the foundation of America's competitive advantage, where we thought, and by we I mean both Democrats and Republicans back in the 1990s, that we could use trade, that we could use global capitalism, that we could use our investment, our dollars, to get them to be more like us. What a flaw that was. What they realized over the last 30 years much sooner, they've been practicing it over the last 30 years, is that they could use their money, access to their market, to get us to be more like them. Or even better, more accurately, use our money to get us to be more like them, and it has worked. Where we thought we could send Big Macs and Happy Meals and somehow that was gonna spread democracy to places like China, what they realized is that they could actually send back those Disney movies and Nike sneakers as Trojan horses to undermine the United States from within and create that false moral equivalence between American idealism and Chinese nihilism. 
So, so that's the scale of the problem. It's not just a trend in cultural trend in markets here at home. It is a cultural trend that goes to the essence of preserving both capitalism and democracy. The stakes for capitalism are the focus of companies themselves. We will see in a matter of minutes, if not already while I'm on the stage, what the GDP numbers were as to whether or not we are in a technical recession. You know, diversity is conformity, inclusion is exclusion. We say war is peace and a recession is something other than two consecutive quarters of GDP decline, apparently. But that's, that, that's where we are here at, here at home. <laughs> and, and yet, at the same time, we actually are contributing to that, uh, that very agenda that's eroding our economic foundation by refocusing companies away from what companies are supposed to do. Provide products and services for profit through a system that we call capitalism, the best known system to mankind to lift people up, including people up from poverty. This new trend not only undermines capitalism's ability to deliver on that promise, but it also undermines democracy's ability to deliver on its promise where every citizen is given an equal voice and equal say not on what products rise to the top of the market, that's what free market capitalism does, but on what ideas rise to the top of a democracy. How we address, whether we address global climate change, systemic racism, whatever, these are important questions that every citizen has an equal stake and an equal voice and say in determining the answer to. But by delegating that answer to a small group of capitalist elites, we drain the lifeblood out of both capitalism and democracy with deep-seated geopolitical implications that actually advantage our greatest geopolitical foe and threat over the course of the next several decades in that process. That's how deep this problem runs. Now, I promised you in the second half of this talk we would get to the solutions. And I think the solutions and the path to solutions are bright, especially if this group of people is able to play a leadership role in delivering it. I think the answer to this problem rests not at the federal government, but with the states. And I think each of you wear two hats, both of which I think can be powerful levers for change. Both your hat as a lawmaker that corrects some of the misbehaviors we see in the market, some of the betrayals we see of those market principles from within the market itself. But also, and this is probably the most important part of this because it doesn't get discussed enough, also wearing your hat as market actors, which I'm gonna come back to at the end. Wearing your lawmaking hat one of the things I say is we actually have an opportunity in a bipartisan sense to restore the basic American vision of both pursuing the American dream and expressing yourself as, at the same time as a free citizen by putting some basic ideas back into motion like protecting free expression in the private sector. I think states have an opportunity to recognize what the authors of the civil rights statutes accidentally left as their unfinished work back in 1964. To say that if you cannot discriminate against somebody on account of their race or their sex or their sexual orientation or their national origin or religion, then you should not be able to discriminate against somebody on account of their political beliefs, their expressed political beliefs either. Now, I bring this example up because it's the kind of conversation we ought to be having. It puts pressure on the classical 1980s style wisdom. I used to call myself a libertarian myself. The kind of wisdom that says that the free market should be able to solve this problem. The last thing we should want to do is impose another constraint on what a private business can and can't do. This is compelling. I used to think this way myself. However, the, the overarching lesson I'll leave with you is that the free market cannot fix what it is not free to fix. You cannot apply these standards without an even hand to say that if we're not going to allow businesses to be able to make judgments on who they work with on account of a wide range of other parameters, if we say that you can't fire somebody or deplatform somebody because they're black or gay or Muslim or white or Christian or Hindu or Jewish or whatever, We've got to say that you also should not be able to fire somebody or deplatform somebody just because they are an outspoken conservative or an outspoken liberal for that matter. You cannot have it both ways. Maybe we can actually go back to a world where we trust the market to do its work and to say that if these businesses are firing people for political reasons or for racial reasons, that creates a great opportunity for these other businesses to hire them. That's a coherent worldview in my opinion. But we can't create a situation where, and I've seen this in the private sector, where the civil rights statutes and the protected classes that we created around them actually put into motion 
the very basis for rampant viewpoint-based discrimination we see in the private sector today. I'll be, I'll be more specific. Where 60 years of expanded jurisprudence, including by the Supreme Court for many of those decades was a, was a culprit in this, said that the civil rights statutes protected classes of race and gender and, and now sexual orientation and religion and national origin didn't just mean you couldn't discriminate. It also meant that you could not express or create a hostile work environment, that you could not create a harassing environment where a hostile work environment actually includes the expression of certain contrary viewpoints to what was presumed to be the view of that protected class. So in the very process of putting those market restrictions into motion, we actually created the groundwork for the rampant viewpoint-based discrimination we see in the private sector today while leaving viewpoint-based discrimination unprotected. So what I say is you can't have it both ways. Either we trust the market or we apply those standards even-handedly, but we cannot use the law to constrain the free market's ability to actually be a free market without finishing our homework on the other end of it. That is a debatable proposition. The idea of making political belief a protected class and a civil right at the state level, that is a debatable proposition. I think that is the debate, though, that we need to be having to unshackle ourselves from 1980s style orthodoxies, reminding ourselves, as Abraham Lincoln reminded his compatriots 160 years ago, that the dogmas of a quiet past are inadequate to the stormy present. And what I say is that the dogmas of 1980 for the conservative movement are inadequate to meet the unique challenges of 2022. So these are the kinds of debates that I think we ought to be having as policymakers that wear the first hat of solving the problem created in the market by the law through additions to the law or subtractions from the law, but changes to the law nonetheless that help solve the spread of this new cultural virus in American capitalism. I think there's an even more promising solution, however, and that is to solve this same problem, wearing your hat not as market regulators, but as market actors. And this story traces actually back to one of the invisible problems that has actually been hiding in plain sight. Once you see it, you cannot unsee it. It is the problem created in American capitalism today by the one industry that is upstream of all of the others. That is the asset management industry, the industry that directs the flow of capital into every other major industry. Okay. It reveals the farce of the idea that we live in a modern free capitalist society when a small handful of market actors, as few as three in the case of the passive asset management industry, are the effectively controlling owners of the allegedly competing companies across our sectors. Apple and Microsoft, Coke, Pepsi, Disney, Paramount Pictures, Exxon, Chevron. We think these companies compete against each other. Well, maybe they do in the marketplace of products, but they don't in the marketplace of ideas. Ask yourself why their top shareholders are the same institutions. BlackRock, State Street, Vanguard, just those three firms manage over $22 trillion. That is more than the GDP of the United States. And what they're doing is that they're using the force of that capital, that shareholder power, to actually force these companies in the boardroom to behave in the very ways that I'm describing, including the disparate behavior with respect to the United States and China. Because many of those asset management firms, starting with BlackRock, see their own biggest growth opportunities actually by doing business in China. BlackRock happens to be the first foreign owner of a domestic asset management subsidiary business in China. They did not get that without meeting the CCP's conditions, but American capitalism is left holding the bag when these $22 trillion behemoths are actually driving this corporate behavior behind the scenes. And what I just described to you there is perhaps the largest scale fiduciary breach in the last century, where this isn't George Soros we're talking about using his own money, $20 billion or whatever, his own money. We're talking about a small handful of firms using 20 plus trillion dollars of your constituents' money, their money, the citizens' money, our money, to advance agendas in corporate America's boardrooms, politicized social agendas in corporate America's boardrooms, 
that most of the ultimate owners of capital, the everyday citizens of this country, actually disagree with. That is the largest scale fraud, not just financial fraud, but ideological fraud of our century. And no one has seriously stepped up to do something about it yet. That's the opportunity hiding in plain sight. And as I said, once you see it, you can't unsee it. A small group of actors using $20 trillion of citizen money to advance political and social agendas through our system of free market, free market capitalism that most of those citizens actually disagree with. And it is happening at such a large scale that it even presents an anti-competitive problem. I'm, I'm mostly an antitrust skeptic. I'm just gonna put that on the table. But I'll tell you, if antitrust law is to police any problem, this is close to the top of that list. Where, imagine if you got the CEOs of Exxon and Chevron and ConocoPhillips and a few more, add a few more to the list, BP Shell, et cetera, put them in the same room. And together they decided that, you know, we're gonna cut gas production. And we're going to see gas prices go up at the pump, but we're gonna dress that up and say we're doing it to, to advance the social good. That would be a cut and dry price fixing violation. Handcuffs, this would be the stuff of movies, people going to jail for that type of price fixing violation. <laughs> Yet the top shareholders of those firms mandate that they do the exact same thing and somehow we celebrate that as ESG instead. That's a problem. It's a problem hiding in plain sight, but the reason it's hiding is it's been wrapped with the veneer of virtue and morality that's been a tripwire to the systems of accountability. And the worst part of this problem is that it also comes with deep-seated conflicts of interest. So many of those projects that say Exxon drops, and this is, this is a true story, right? Exxon has reduced its oil production targets by, over, by about 20% from its prior forecasts after BlackRock State Street and Vanguard just a year and a half ago put new directors onto Exxon's board to provide its climate change strategy. Imagine what that's doing to gas prices now, reducing US supply of oil, not because of a technical Biden administration policy, but because of a private sector ESG policy. Ask yourself, who's at the front of the line to pick up some of those very projects? It's actually firms like PetroChina that would be well positioned to pick up those projects. But then, and this is, a, this is a fun fact not a lot of people know, you look up who's the top shareholder or among the top shareholders that own 6% of PetroChina, it's actually none other than BlackRock. So you think about this, the large asset management complexes that demand that the US behave and US companies behave in a certain way to stave off global climate change are actually giving the projects effectively from the left hand to the right while the American consumer and the American investor and most importantly, the American citizen are left holding the bag. Now, where this story, this story takes a surprising turn is that it's easy for us to criticize BlackRock, State Street, and Vanguard as the other. As far as I know, they're not in this room, okay? And if they are, that's fine. I gave a talk yesterday where someone from BlackRock was in the room. We had a great conversation on the back of it. I'm fine, we'll say, say the same thing both ways. But here's the part you don't expect. Our states are in many cases behaving in the same way. Two red states, uh, Florida's one of them, and this is surprising, actually voted for those same directors onto Exxon's board. Voted against the recommendation of Apple's management. Keep in mind, this is a progressive company made nine-figure donations to BLM and related movements. Apple's management team recommended against a shareholder proposal that called for a regularized racial equity audit at Apple. And states, including red states, ended up being the ones who voted for that proposal at actually the equivalence at places like, you know, Goldman Sachs, JP Morgan, you name it in terms of many other companies. So, you know, Facebook had a shareholder proposal for the renomination of two of its longstanding directors, Peter Thiel and Mark Andreessen, that one red state voted against, but also voted for in that same election to appoint a civil rights representative to its board. So this isn't BlackRock, State Street, and Vanguard I'm talking about anymore. This is US states, and not just US states, but red states in this country. That's a problem, but the good news is that's an easy problem to solve. And I think that this is where the future rests. The next wave, the next five years of solving this problem rests in your hands by recognizing that historically the market actors, the asset managers that the financial institutions of this country have catered to are market actors like CalPERS, CalSTRS, the state of New York where what they did about 10 years ago was to start to tell these financial institutions and asset managers that we only want to do business with the firm that advances the vision and way of the future. And you know what? We're the biggest ones, so you have to pay attention to us. And quietly what happened is everyone else got taken for a ride along the way. I think if the 
if the rest of the states, in between, geographically and otherwise, those states, recognize that the collective market power of the citizens represented by those other states is being disrespected, those states can actually band together and take back that market power to say that our pension funds, our state treasuries, the state aggregated capital of citizens in those countries will not be used to advance these agendas. And I think that is the lowest hanging fruit for how we're able to drive this change, not by making laws regulating how companies behave or not. All laws have unintended consequences when regulating the market. But by taking back the market power that already belongs to the states and citizens themselves. And to me, this is not just a choice. This is, a, this is mandatory because it's not even your money or the money of the people who sit in this room. It's the money of your citizens, your constituents, that's being used to advance this agenda, defrauding them of not just their money, but their voice and their very identity as well. And I think there is an opportunity to, for state legislatures to look within, to not just point our finger at the other, but to look at deeply at what we see in the mirror and find the parts that we don't like and have the courage to fix that within. There is a managerial cancer pervading the government. And those of you in this room are part of the politically accountable class. And with that designation comes both great power and great responsibility to make sure that the class within your state that is not politically accountable, that is appointed on a pension fund board, that even less accountable works at an investment staff overseen by that board, understands that they too are accountable to the very people who you serve rather than to their own objectives and their own vision of crony capitalism that was born through the relationship with the financial sector over the course of the last decade. So I hope we get into some of that discussion in our panel. This is the promising way of states actually driving change to the problem of woke capitalism. It will not be a US president. It will not be the US Congress. It will not be a US Senate that solves this problem. I think it will be state legislatures and state executive leaders across the country. And I hope that that begins starting now. So thank you and I look forward to the panel. Thank you.